Savior Jesus Christ, to my wife, Pastor Anderson, who is yet recovering, and we thank the saints of God for the prayers for Pastor uh, Beverly Anderson, and we celebrate the live streaming audience on this Palm Sunday, the first Sunday of the month. Amen. This is the week that Jesus rose into Jerusalem triumphantly. Amen. On the coat, the fold of an ass. Amen. He's truly king of kings and lord of lords. But according to the scripture, one week they were saying Hosanna. Realize this is the... Uh, they were saying Hosanna. Save us now, Lord. Save us. In the following week, they were saying crucify him. For when there's no cross, beloved, there's no crown. And Paul says, there's set for him a crown of righteousness, and not for him only, but for all those that do love his appearance, the appearance of Jesus Christ. But he's coming back again for a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. We're going to go into the Word of God, taken from Ephesians. We're going to pick up the, the sixth chapter where we left off on last week. We talked about the children obeying their parents to the Lord because it's the right thing to do. But the following verses, the third verse, it says, For the Father, in the fourth verse, Ephesians 6 and 4, King James Version, And ye fathers, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nature, nurture, and admonition of the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for this Palm Sunday, how you did ride into Jerusalem, a victorious king. And you didn't come riding on a white stallion or a black stallion, but you came riding on a donkey. You came riding into Jerusalem with humility, respect, and honor. And for that, we say thank you. And Lord God, as we attempt to give your word on this um, afternoon, afternoon manner, Lord, we ask you to bless those who hear your word. Let the word of God be sown into our spiritual being. Feed us bread of heaven until we want no more. For Lord, we can't do nothing without you, and neither will we try. Let your word heal. Let it set free and let it deliver. In Jesus' name, for your grace we pray. Let the church say, Amen. So our scripture today, beloved, is from Ephesians 6, 4, talking on that Paul was talking to the church of Ephesus, and most of his letters were written from the prison cell. In the first verse, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And when we had talked on last week, but let me know, it was not only natural, biological parents, but also spiritual parents in which the children had to obey. The second verse said, Honor thy father and mother, that thy days may be long upon the earth. And this is a commandment that God gave us a promise, that if we honor our parents spiritually and naturally, how will we receive long life upon the earth? That it may be well with thy soul. In the fourth verse is where we're going to take our subject out at today. And you fathers, you fathers, God is talking to the male. Provoke not your children to wrath. Don't make your children angry. But bring them up in the nature and the admonition of the Lord. So Paul is telling the children to obey their parents, but also the parents have responsibility to God. As we talked about on last week, the, the hierarchy, how the, we had the child have to honor their parents and the mother is the head of the, over the children, the children is the head, of, the father is the head of the mother and the children, and Christ is the head of the man and the family, and God is the head of Christ. So we talked about that on last week. And the Bible lets us to know that we ought to honor those that are in authority, and those to honor and to respect those who watch out for our soul, and that's what it's all about. There was a song years ago saying that I'm a soul man. I'm a three-part being. I'm a spirit, soul, and body. I'm a spirit that God breathed into my soul. And I in my body, I became a living soul. My body is my shell that, that in house, houses my soul. 
And one day my body is going to go back to the dust. But my soul will live on forever. Whether in heaven with God or in hell with the enemy, the choice is yours. This is why the Bible tells us that we ought to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Now, fathers, we're not to provoke our children to wrath, but to bring them up into a uh, nature and admiration of the Lord, or the fear of the Lord, which is the reverence of God. Now, to me, the Lord's Prayer is an illustration of who God is as our Heavenly Father. So much in these just few verses. It tells us a lot about God. It tells us a lot about fathers. And it tells us a lot about men, how men ought to be. So in Matthew 6 and 9 is where we're going to lay our foundation on this morning, this afternoon. When the disciples wanted to know how to pray, like John told his disciples to pray, Jesus said, when you pray, you don't want to be as a hypocrite, but you want to go into your closet, your secret closet, and seek your father and um, secretly, secretly, and when you seek God like that, how he will reward you openly. In other words, don't pray just to be seen of men, but pray to your heavenly Father. He said, after this manner, this is how you ought to pray. And as I first said, the Lord's Prayer, it illustrates how a father ought to be. Thinking about going right back to Ephesians 6 and 4, children, father, provoke not your children to wrath. But bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So Jesus said, after this manner, therefore, you ought to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed is thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Oh, holy is your name. That's the point of reverence that you have for God. And you're not praying to God as he's some far out being, but you're praying to him as your heavenly Father. And the Father has a responsibility Last week we talked about responsibility, accountability, and the hierarchy. And this week we're going to add availability. A father ought to be available to their children. We have a lot of fathers in these days that we're living in. They have no availability, no accountability, no responsibility to their children. But in the book of Michael, the last book of the, uh, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, it says how in the last days God would turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. And these are the days that we're living in. But we're living in times where many of the children that's out here, especially male children, they don't have a father. They don't have a covering over their lives. And basically their backs is doing what they want to do because they can't take chastisement, corrections, reproof, or, or, or rebuke. They get offended real quick. So he's letting us know that when you pray, you pray to your father. And, and if you never had a father, even though one might have birthed you, but one, a, a male may not have fathered you. So when you pray to your father, say, our father which are in heaven. Not my earthly father, but my, but my heavenly father. And we had used the scripture in the Psalms that said, when your father and mother forsake you, how the Lord will take you up. In my life, I had talked about being a little transparent. Even though we had a male figure in the home, we had no father to father me. So the streets become your father. But God, once he saved my soul in 1974, he became my father. He taught me how to be a man. Because if I had a fallen example of my father, as I first said, good and bad, even to this day. You know, my sons see good and bad in me. The bad that they see in me is maybe the mistakes, the things I did not know. Not the things that I did intentionally, but the things that I've learned. Where do you learn them from? Did I learn them from my father? So you need that role model in your life as a male to show you how to father. So God took me up when my father forsook me. Basically not doing his responsibility, his accountability, his availability for my life. But that's all right. These are the times that we're living on. These are the times that tribe men show. You can't be better, but you got to be bitter, but you have to be better. And sometimes you have to learn from past experiences. Because if you get bitter, you'll never learn. You'll procreate that which was placed into your life. And he's letting us know that he's in heaven, not on earth, our heavenly father. But he's with us always. And he said, holy is your name. Hallowed is your name. He's a holy God. Then it says, thy kingdom comes. So my father has a kingdom. And thy will be done in earth. I need God's will to be done in me. 
in my in my life because I when do I I come from the dust of the earth. I'm partially uh, earthly and partially heavenly because God took the time out once He formed man from the dust of the earth and He breathed into man nostrils the breath of life, and man became a, a little soul. For my DNA is really from heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. As a deer panteth after the water, go so my soul panteth after thee, O God. I want to be in his image and in his likeness according to Genesis, that first chapter. For God told the triune Godhead, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. So let me know that my DNA, our DNA as man, as men, is from really from heaven. So we have to bring our will into the will of God. In the 11th verse, it says, give us this day our daily bread. I need my daily bread from my heavenly father. When Jesus was tempted by the enemy to turn stone into bread after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible points out that he was hungry, he was weak. But he told Satan that thou man should not live by bread alone. Man, the man side of us shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. My DNA is from heaven. And the only way I live is through his birth. For Paul said, I live, I move, and I have my being in Christ Jesus. This is how I exist. Then Paul goes on to say, in the life that I now live, and I'm saying, I'm repeating what Paul said, because I agree with him 110%. The life that I now live, I live through the strength, through the grace of the Son of God, who died for my sins. So Lord, give us this day our daily bread. So it's letting me know that God will provide all of your needs according to your his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. As I foresaid, this Lord's Prayer is a template to fatherhood. What does a father do? He provides for his children. Give us this day our daily bread. Then also he lets us know another characteristic of a father. In the 12th verse, and forgive us of our debts. Our Father should be forgiven. Our Heavenly Father is forgiven. And the only way that you can receive forgiveness from God is by forgiving those that offend you. Because the Bible lets us know that if you want forgiveness from God, you must first forgive those who offended you. And forgive us of our debts, as we also forgive our debtor. This is a characteristic that God places in us to error. To make mistakes, to offend someone, is human. Because you don't always know how other people think. But to forgive is divine. That's a gift that comes from God. God, give me a heart like that so that I can have a heart to forgive those that trespass against me. So in order for my debt to be forgiven, I have to be willing to forgive someone else's debt. And about a month ago, two months ago, I can't remember, <clears throat> I was forgiven for about $70,000, almost $70,000 in student loans. And at that same particular time, someone owed me uh, 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 some, some money. I'm not going to say how much, but it was placed in my heart to forgive that person, which owed me so much less than what I owe the federal government. And I forgave that person that debt. For that reason, and for that reason alone, because I was forgiven. And I was able to forgive that person for the debt that they owed to me. It's like the scripture was saying. One guy owed to the king about a thousand talents, ten thousand talents. He begged for mercy. But he wasn't willing to forgive someone that owed him less, a hundred talents. And when the king found out, he called that individual a wicked servant. So if you want to be forgiven by God, I don't care what you've, been, what you've done, what you're doing, and who you're doing it with, God will forgive you. But you have to be willing to forgive those who trespass against you. And that's the thing. A lot of times we want God to forgive us, but we, don't want, we want to continue to, to harbor unforgiveness or hate or dislike in our hearts. But God, he forgives us. <coughs> And what he does when he forgives us, he casts our sins into the sea of forgetfulness 
to be remembered no more because God is a forgiving God. A father ought to be able to forgive their children because children are going to be children. Like they oftentimes say, boys is going to be boys. Kids are going to be kids. And it's a learning process, a learning curve in which a father has a responsibility to teach that child, their children, how to have a forgiving heart because we've been forgiven. Then the scripture goes on in the 13th verse and says, and lead us not into temptation. We're going to be, we, we're going to be tested and we're going to be tried. And sometimes if we just take the time to listen to the voice of God, we can make it through whatever storm or whatever test the enemy is throwing at us. It's when we don't listen. But let that be stumbling block in your life. Be a stepping stone. So we ask God to lead us. And this is why Jesus said he wasn't going to leave us comfortless. And how he would pray the Father, pray the Father, pray the Father, that he would send us another comforter, a paracletus, to lead us into God us into all truth. Who will lead us? Because sometimes, especially when pressure is coming upon you, when the vicissitudes of life is coming at you left and right, like the storm that we had in Delaware was saying how it was a tornado, tornado warning on the East Coast. Lord, God can see you through the storms of this life, the vicissitudes of this life, beloveds. So we don't, if we ask the Father, don't lead us into temptation. When my heart is overwhelmed, and sometimes when your heart is overwhelmed, that's when you make the most mistake, mistakes, when you can't think clear, when you don't take the time out to say, Lord, lead me and guide me into all your truth, but to err is human, but to forgive is divine. And that's what it says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. They're going to make mistakes, but bring them up, spiritually and naturally, your children, but bring them up in the fear, the nature, and the admonition of the Lord, because God forgave us. And sometimes when we get saved, we forget where God brought us from. We forget that we were drug addicts, poor mongers, liars, thieves, Midnight Ramblers. But when we get saved, we act like we're holier than thou. We don't have the patience to forgive others. Lord, lead us not into temptation. And the devil, he is the tempter. He's going to tempt you. But the Bible teaches us this, beloved. There is no temptation that's common unto man that God has not already made a way of escape. God, show me the escape route. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And it's a light unto my pathway. Help me to follow the instructions of your word. Help me to take time out to seek your faith. You're my heavenly father. Nothing is hidden from God. God lead me and guide me. And a father, you ought to be able to, uh, to, to, to share your heart with him. To be open with your father. Not to begin to hide things from your father. Because he been through the same things that you've been through. So he can tell you how to cross the road. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, lead us. That's why we brought the song, we sung the song a little bit this morning. Um, <clears throat> give us this day our daily bread. In Matthew 6 and 15, it says, But if you forgive, not men that trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. So to be a father, beloved, is a very sacred honor that God has placed upon us as men. <laughs> I understand some men don't want to be men no more. They want to trans. They want to transfigure themselves. They want to be something other than what God made them because they lost the identity of who. They are and whose they are. But to those of us that once yet to be men, that realize that's an honor to be a man, especially in these last evil days. I was <clears throat> listening, I was looking at something I believe on social media the other day, and someone asked a man, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to be a doctor, a lawyer? What do you want to be? And what he said, I said, I just want to be a man. And I want to be a good man. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. That's what I want to be. Those other things is what I could 
uh, uh, titles that they can tag on me. I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a firefighter, I'm this, that, and the other. But in reality, I want to be a man of God. I want to be a man after God's own heart. And God has placed that awesome responsibility on mankind. So a father ought to be validated. A father validates his children. And what I mean by validate, validation, <clears throat> we all need to be validated. Jesus needed it. When he was at the Jordan River to be baptized, and he told John, the Baptist, his, his cousin, that I had need to be baptized of thee. Suffer me to be baptized. John said, you know, I'm not worthy to be baptized. I'm not worthy to loose the, 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 the latches on your shoes. Be this a suffer to be so, for it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. And when he baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, baptism is an outward show of an inward change. They call it a watery grave. You're buried with Christ in baptism. You rise to walk in the newness of life. You want to go down, save, and come out to walk the newness of life. You want to go down a repentant sinner. You don't want to go down a wet devil and come up and come up a uh, go down a dry devil and come up a wet devil, but you want to go down as a dry, repentant sinner so that you can rise to walk in the newness of life. Amen. So, but the clouds opened up. The Spirit of God, the dove, came down from heaven and it rested upon Jesus. And the voice came out of the clouds talking about validation. This is what a father does for his children, for his sons, especially for his sons. The voice said, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Even, not only do sons need to be validated, but daughters need to be validated. To say that you're more, you can be more than what you are. You know, you don't let no one disrespect you, but the most important thing, fathers, Sons and daughters, don't disrespect yourself. Because if you don't disrespect yourself, if you disrespect yourself, if you don't love yourself, guess what? No one else will. So it's, uh, that children, they need validation from their father. God, God as I first said, he validated Jesus. So it's so, it's so, vital, it's so vital to be validated Knowing who you are, knowing why you are, but the most important part is knowing who you are. Because sometimes your heart gets overwhelmed, and sometimes you begin to wonder in your mind, is God with me? And he'll come and say, this is my beloved son. I want to hear his voice say to me, well done. Well done. That validation that's approval from my Heavenly Father. Well done. You've been faithful over a few things. And I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Jacob had to validate his sons. Telling them who they are. You're children of the Most High God. Let me tell you something, beloved. <laughs> you may live in a teepee, in an igloo, in a shack, but as long as you know that God is my heavenly Father, it's well with my soul. God said he will supply my needs. He'll look out for me according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Jacob had to validate his son in Genesis 48 and 14. And Israel, he stretched out his hand when the children of Israel had came out of Egypt. And you know the story about Joseph, how he rose to second position in, in Egypt. But Jacob was about to die. And he wanted to bless, validate, validation. He wanted to validate Joseph and Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And when he placed his hands to bless Manasseh, which was the oldest son, 
Joseph uncrossed his hands and said, no, put the blessing upon Ephraim. Let me read it. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, got his head wickedly for Manasseh. He was the firstborn. The 17th verse, Genesis 48 and 17. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon Ephraim, it did please him, because Joseph understood that the oldest, the blessing should go to the oldest, just like the situation with Jacob and Esau. But Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. And it did please him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim, which was the youngest, and unto Manasseh. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Manasseh is the firstborn. Talking about validation. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused. Because he wanted the blessing to be upon Ephraim's head. And said, I know it. I know he's the oldest. My son. He said, I know it. He also will become a great people. But truly the younger shall be greater than he. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. These young guys, were, young fellows were validated by Jacob before he died. And Jacob validated his 12 sons. When he was getting ready to die, he rose up to tell them what they would be. How the scepter would not depart from 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 from, from Shiloh until uh, 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 from um, Jordan until Shiloh come. Yeah, so we need validation from our spiritual parents, and not only do we need validation, we need protection. That's what a father does. He validates and he protects. Job, what he did every day, he prayed for his children. This is how we protect our loved ones. I pray for my, my sons and my daughters and my family all the time. Job sent up sacrifices for his children because he said they might have charged God foolishly in their folly when they were celebrating. They might have said something that they ought not to have said. So he prayed for his father. He prayed for his family. Let me know that all was well because that was the that's the responsibility of every man. You, you're not only to protect your family, but you are, you are the covering for your family. You're the covering. My God in heaven. Job covered his family by offering up sacrifices to God on a daily basis. And thank God that he did so. Because hell and high water broke out in Job's wife. So when a person knows how to cover, he knows how to get covered too. So when Job heard about all the trouble that was coming upon him, he lost his ten children in one day. One day. The Bible says how he got down in sackcloth and ash and he began to pray unto God the Father. So as a father, we are a protector, but we also are priests to cover our family. This is why the scripture said, when my mother and father forsake me, how the Lord will take me up. Not only in death, sometimes... Homes don't have a father to cover them. Got to be your cover. And that's what God became to me. He covered me. Because my dad wasn't there to cover me. So God became, and he is, my heavenly father. He taught me how to be a man. He taught me how to provide. That's the responsibility of a man. We thank God for the helpmate for the women. You know, they have their job. They're helping the family. They, some, of them, some of them work. <coughs> on the outside of the home and on the inside of the home. But it's the man's responsibility to provide for his family. But the system is set up so much so, beloved, that the burden has been placed on the family so that most of the time the mother has to go out and work too. So if the father and mother is going out to work, who's taking care of the children? Oh, the daycare. Then you look at the society in which we live today. Do you really want certain people to take care of your children? People that don't believe God? But this is the trick of the enemy. 
to draw the parents away from the home. God will take care of This is why we ought to bring, the Bible says, train up your child in the way that they should go. So that when they get older, they won't depart. And this is the training that I see as the head of the family. My, my responsibility, my account, accountability, my availability is to lead by example. Actions always, I say action always speak louder than any words that you could see. The Bible says, the, the, how they say, a picture is worth a thousand, uh, one picture is worth a thousand words. When your children see that you love in your you love your wife, when the children see that you sacrifice for your family, they take on that persona and do the same thing that they seen you do. Now they see you not doing, they're not gonna want to do either. You can't take the Cosby show to be your to be your your babysitters. You have to be the example to your family. So a father is there to protect, the father is there to be the priest over their home, to train up your children in the way that they should go, that when they get old, they won't depart. But you say, Bishop, I trained my children in the house of God, and now they're doing every other thing. But let me tell you something. That foundation that you placed in them will never go away. It's hard to tear out a foundation. They may go away just like the prodigal son did. There's prodigal sons and prodigal daughters out there. And most of the time, God will tempt their heart to come to themselves and say, I can do better than this. I'm going home, back to my father. But the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to say to God, Father, I've sinned against heaven and i sinned against thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son, but make me as one of your higher servants. I'm, 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 I'm ready to serve now. And sometimes we get bigger than we get uppity as children. This is why in Ephesians 6 and 4, it says, Father, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't whip them with a, with a cat of nine tails and beat them over the head with your religion, but be an example unto the flock. The Bible says, take heed to yourself and to the flock of which the Holy Ghost has made the overseer, which Christ Jesus has purchased with his own blood. So we ought to be an example to our family. We ought to, our children ought to be saying, I want to be like my dad. And the daughters should be saying, I want to be like my mother. I want to be a chaste housekeeper. I want to be a virtuous woman. I want to be a man's man. I don't want to go around switching. I don't want to go around beating up on my wife. I don't want to go around stealing and lying. I want to be an honest person. I want to be an honest man. I want to be a righteous man. I want to be a man after God's own heart. So the man's father had the right to correct his children. If you can't receive correction, the Bible said if you're a bastard and not a son. And I, I, I am so thankful. I cannot tell you how thankful I am that God chasing me when I get off point. Because sometimes you think you all of that in a bag of chips and God, and God will let you know that you have not arrived yet. Things that come up where you'll fall short of the glory of God. And God has said, see, told you, you wasn't ready. The songwriter said, draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. The other songwriter said, there's room at the cross for me. And I thank God. The Bible said that God chastened those he loved. Lord God, would you see that I'm going the wrong way? Correct me. How does, how does God correct us? I'm glad you asked that question. This Bible is not upside down, but it's right side up. He corrects us through his word. Thy word have I hid in my heart so that I might not sin against thee. Oh, Lord. Thy word, his word, beloved, is forever settled in heaven. Is a lamp unto my feet, and it's a light unto my pathway. His word, the entrance of his word, it gives light, beloved. This Bible, God's holy word, has kept my soul safe for 49 years. Because I want to be a doer of God's word. And not a hearer talker only. Are you perfect, Bishop? No. Because every time I look at a perfect law of liberty, I realize that there's still room for improvement. Draw me closer. Lord, help me to forget those 
who trespassed against me. That is one of the hardest things to do when you gave your heart to someone, whether it's your wife, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your, your parents, whether it's your siblings, whether it's your best friend, and they break your heart. That's the hardest pill to swallow. But if you don't swallow that pill, you can't be forgiven. Validation. That's what God is wanting us to do today. He wants to validate you. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But this is one thing that I do know. That when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In the background, you have the palm, that one week wherein they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Save us now. That's what Hosanna means. And the following week, there was Jesus on that cross. They were saying, crucify him. But you know what? When he was on that cross, he said words. As I first said, that Lord's Prayer is the illustration of how a father should be and how a man should be, how a God man should be. That I believe within my heart, and I could be wrong. I tell my wife I'm, not, I'm wrong 99% of the time. But 1%, it belongs to me. That if he hadn't said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, that judgment would have came upon all of us. But he prayed that prayer, and he prayed it, even though they had whipped him with a cat of nine tails throughout the night, even though they had lied upon Jesus, even though they smote him on the face, smacked him on the face, just why he said, if they smack you one cheek, turn the other. They pulled the hairs out of his out of his face from his beard. They placed a crown of thorns, seventy-two thorns. They took the time to make a crown and place it on his tender bra. They nailed him to a rugged cross. He was a carpenter. No doubt, every time he was kneeling, hammering and nailing to some wood, he could see himself being hammered to the cross on Golgotha Hill, Calvary Mountain, the hill of the skull. They put nails in his hands, spikes in his hands, spikes in his feet. Not only did they did that, they pierced him in the side. Out came blood and water. With all of that happening, with thieves on one side mocking him, saying, if you be who you say you are, I don't need you to validate me. My father did it at the Jordan River. He did it at the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's going to do it again. One thief said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, I just want you to remember me. And that prayer from that one thief, it helps to encourage Jesus' heart to utter these words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So those who God loves, he chases, beloved. <laughs> When a son is not chastened, they go into so much mischief. You're afraid to correct your children. <laughs> You're afraid to, you don't want to fall out with them. Tell them the truth. And they will respect you for telling the truth. That's the responsibility of a parent. That's the responsibility of a father. Eli, the prophet, he had two sons that were working in the house of God. They were priests. Eli and Hephna, Hephna and Philonis. And this is what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 2 and 34. When you don't chasten your children, when you don't respect them. I used to I tell my, my youngest son, Brian, I tell him, and I could be wrong as I first said. I said, I am not your friend. I'm your father. To me, to be a father is more honorable than just to be a friend. I'm not here to buddy with you, even though we may have good times together. And I love you and I give my life for you. But I'm your father. A friend may not correct you. A friend may be afraid to tell you the truth, but I'm not going to be afraid to tell you the truth. Because I'm your father and you're my son. Or you're my daughter. I have a daughter also. But Eli, he refused to rebuke his children. In 1 Samuel 2 and 34, he said, This shall be a sign. Until you see 
parents out there getting high with their children, going to the bar with their children. One thing my son never did, never smoked in front of me because we trained him right. Never drank, drunk alcohol in front of me because we trained them right. They gave us that honor, realizing that my parents are holy parents. They don't do stuff like that. I'm not your friend. I'm your father. And he shall, and he shall, 1 Samuel 2 and 34 says, And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thee, come upon thy two sons of Hophni and Philonah, and the and one day, they shall die, both of them, because you refuse to correct them. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. Just like my, my, <laughs> my you hear people say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you that whooping, because if I don't give it to you, the law will. So if you train your children at home, you can stop them from getting beat up. In the street by law enforcement because they don't have no, no filter on their life. And God said, because told Eli, because you didn't do the right by your son by correcting them, both of them are going to die in one day. In 1 Samuel 3 and 13, it says, For I had told them that I would judge his house forever for the iniquity that he knew. He knew what was going on, how they were prostituting the women in the church. Like a lot of people are doing today, they're prostituting the cheap. Letting them do whatever they want to do. Knowing that they're whoremongering, knowing that they're lying, knowing that they're not, that they're stealing, but they're still doing the same they're doing work in the church, preaching in the church. Instead of rebuking them, before, back in the day when I came to them, a preacher fell, they sat him down. Do your first works over again. You sin. You're supposed to be an example to the flock. flock. If the flock see that you're getting away with it, they don't think they can get away with it too. Just like what's going on with our ex-president. How they want to persecute the district attorney of New York, Brad. No one's supposed to be above the law. Who's above the law? God. God set the law in order, not man. And if this one man can get away with it, why can't we all get away with it? If this one man can get away with lying on his tax, why can't we all get away with, along with it, away with it? But no man is supposed to be above the law. And that law is God's law, not man's law. For the iniquity which you knew, you knew what was going on. Because his sons made themselves vow and restrained not themselves. They did whatever they wanted to do because their father was enduring a father responsibility of validating his son, correcting his sons when he seen his sons was going wrong. Elijah wanted a double portion of Elisha wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elijah said, it's not mine to give, but if you see me when I go up, when God take me up, you can have it. This is what a son does for his father. A son will follow his father's footsteps try to live the same type of life his father lived. My youngest son, Brian, I don't know why I'm talking about him so much this morning, this afternoon. But he said, Dad, one thing you taught me how to do, hopefully there's other things. He taught me to hard work, to put in put in the work. No shortcuts. And to this day, that boy get out there, he hustled. That's what I used to do when I'd be out there. But I told him this, as a father, don't Seek to be rich. Don't seek money. Because money will take wings as an eagle, not a pigeon, and it'll fly away from you. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Seek God first. Don't seek to be rich. A lot of people have sought to be rich and their life been wrecked with many sorrows. Because they got the riches, they, they wasn't prepared for that which was received, what, what they received in their life. Couldn't handle it. Most people hit the lottery or divorce, get divorced, or get broke in a few years because they don't know how to manage money. Eli, he never disciplined his children. And this is why the Bible says both of his children died in one day. He died the same day after he heard that his sons died. And not only that, the daughter-in-law had a baby. 
Because once she found out her son, her husband died in, in battle, she had a baby. The baby came forth. And what did they name the baby? Ichabod. What does Ichabod mean? That the presence of the glory of God had departed from this place. When Eli heard that his son died, he fell backwards in the chair, broke his neck, and died. Because God pronounced doom on that house. Because he did not correct his sons when they were vow in the house of God. So <clears throat> our job as a, as a father is correct to, to reprove, to rebuke, to exalt the firm among suffering and doctrine. So as I first said, when you, when you read the Lord's Prayer, if you're looking for a husband, look for one that's doing what the Lord's Prayer said do. And let me tell you this, and I'm done. I'm just about done. The Bible says, when a man don't take care of his own house, he's worse than an infidel. Now, you might have hooked up with someone who had children by someone else before they got saved. And he or she is not, he is not taking care of his children. What makes you think he's going to take care of your children? It doesn't make sense. If he's being mean to his ex, what makes you think he's not going to be mean to you? I used to tell one of my um, daughters, Stockings, do the math. Do the math. If it don't make sense, don't do it. One and one has to make two. If they can't bring nothing to the table, why are you bringing them in? It doesn't make sense. Do the math. And I talked to her like that as a father to a daughter. You know, she, she's my uh, surrogate daughter. But when we receive them, we receive as a daughter. And we give her instructions. If, if, if you want instructions from me, you want to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I'm going to give it to you. And but I, Some of us are like Jack Nicholas. You can't handle the truth. So you get offended in me when I tell you the truth. But I'm telling you the truth from my heart because I care for you. If I didn't care for you, <laughs> the bridge is out. Don't tell that fool the bridge is out. Let it go over it. But because we love you, we're going to tell you the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So I'm a protector of my family. To me, this is one of the most important things. And I'm, I'm going to try to close on this note. We talk about accountability, responsibility. We talk about the, the um, hierarchy. To me, this is one of the most important parts. The last one, the fourth one. Availability. <laughs> one of the songs that always break my heart. It, it, it stirs up my soul. Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you to do what you say. Lord, use me, Lord. It's not about me, it's all about him. So when you have children, if you can't be available for your children, whether spiritually or naturally, you don't need them. Don't have them. If you're not going to be available to them. Oh, I'm out here selling drugs because I got to take care of my family. But when you're doing 10 to 20 years in jail, how are you taking care of your family and making 6 to $7 a day? And they send you commissary money. It doesn't make sense. How are you available to your family when you're working two or three jobs and you're never home to, to care for your wife, the, the woman of your youth, or whether now she's old, but you're looking for something else because you're tired of taking care of responsibility or you're not there for your children? It's important that for a father to be available to your children, to your, to, to your family. And if you're not able to be available to your family, you don't need one. It's the truth. A father ought not to be selfish, self-centered, saying it's all about me. It's not about, it's not all about me. It's all about my family. That's, that's your legacy. When you leave off the scene, they're the one that's going to carry on your name, your ideas, your characteristics. 
When people see you on the street, and, they, and some people that know me, oh, you Bishop Anderson's son? Then I look for my sons to be broken down and looking all messed up on my daughter. You Bishop Anderson? See, I know Bishop Anderson. The Bible says we ought to have a good reputation. And when people speak of evil, you ought to be alive. Yeah, I know Bishop Anderson. He don't run with women. He don't gamble. You know, he's not a midnight rambler. He's a holy man of God. He can be trusted. That's the legacy that you want to leave. Is that my, that's your son? Yeah, that's my son. But if that's your son and he's messing up, you, well, I taught him better. I taught her better, even though she or he is acting different from what I, and that's what's happening in these days, these last and evil days. Sometimes the children act like aliens. Like, who in the world raised you? But the, that's sin, though. I thank God for this. That God looks beyond our faults. And he sees our needs. Even though I'm doing bad things, that really don't make me a bad person. Because sometimes you do things, like I first said, a drug dealer. He's out there taking care of his family. For one reason, he might have got locked up for a misdemeanor, misdemeanor, and now they have him tagged as a criminal, and every time he tries to get a job, he can't get one. So the next thing he does is to try to hustle in the street to make a living, to take care of his family. And the money get good, then he forget focused, he get unfocused and forgot the reason I'm out here is I'm trying to take care of my family, but I can't take care of my family if I'm doing time. Who's going to take care of him? So the system is set up for us to lose, for you to be incarcerated, for you to do crime and go to jail. But this is why it's so important to let God be into your heart, to let him rule on the throne of your heart, beloveds. You get off the throne because you don't know how to rule. I don't know. I didn't know how to rule. Most of my friends that I knew that were in the world, they're either six feet under or they're in time doing, in prison doing time. And the only reason I'm out here is because of the grace and mercy of God. Let me tell you this. I'm out here on credit. Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. My credit, as far as with God, was bad credit. But Jesus has A plus credit. And by his stripes, I've been healed. Jesus paid my sin debt for me. I'm not bragging on my own accomplishments in life because I realize without him, I can do nothing. This is what I realized. I put one one together and said, Bishop, this is not you. How did you accomplish that? How did you do this? How did you do the other? It was only because of the grace and mercies of God. That I'm not consumed. So this is why I proclaim this gospel. Whether I'm doing Bishop Corner, Morning Glory, Afternoon Man, or Evening Man. Regardless of what I do, I do to the glory and honor of God. Because it's because of him I live, I move, I have my being. Nothing. Nothing without Christ in my life. I'm, and by the grace of God, big go I. By the grace of God, that's what I've seen in my life. Only thing I've seen in my life, I tell my sons. My uncle got killed at 28 years, 26 to 28 years old. Wayne Avenue. Right next to the Happy Hollow. He was one of the biggest drug dealers up that way. I used to be over his house all the time. Getting high. Young buck. They killed him. They came in the house, took his drugs, killed him, left, killed the whole house. All in my mind since that time was that I was going to be killed too by the time I was 28. God saved me in 1974. I was 18 years, going on 18 years of age when he saved me. Because if he didn't save me, no doubt I would have been killed also. No doubt I would be six feet under or in prison to this day because of something doing something stupid. So when I look at the world that's around me, beloved, I, I don't look at it as a judge. I look at it and say, there's help. If God, like Paul said, he was chief sinner. If God can save me, 
I'm a miserable life of sin. I got miserable in my sin. He can save anybody. All you have to do is repent of your sin and say, God, I'm a sinner. And I can't make this life, I can't make it in this world without you. God, forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me from all of my unrighteousness. Lord, I accept Jesus into my life as my personal Savior, Lord, and God. And from this day forward, I promise with all that's within me to serve you with all my heart. God, I ask these blessings in your son Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Bible says that thou shalt be saved. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you are our heavenly father. And you gave us the blueprint of how every father should be and how every man should be. And Lord, I thank you that you gave me someone to help me out, my helpmate, my wife, our, our wives, Lord. We thank you for that. And we thank you, God, that you gave me not just a, a, a wife, but you gave me a virtuous woman. You gave me a holy woman. I, know, I, I, I didn't deserve it. But God, you, you gave it to me. Mm. Yes, sir. And for that, I'm forever grateful. Thank you for my children, my grandchildren. Thank you for my mother, my sisters, my brother. Thank you for my Uncle Charles. Thank you for my family. Thank you, Lord God, for my spiritual children that watch the live stream. Lord, I was so grateful. I'm grateful for all the things that you have done, all the things that you are doing, and for all the things that you're going to do. Lord, we ask these blessings. In Christ's name, and for his grace we pray. Let this prayer say amen. Whew. Father, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. This is Bishop Madison from New Shallow, Holy Hands Healing Ministry, Afternoon Manor. We were late today because I had to take care of my rib. <laughs> I told my son that yesterday. I said, I got to go take care of my rib, which is my wife, because she's recovering. And he said, Dad, you you have your ribs? I said, no, man, I don't take care of your mother. He said, oh, you should have hung up for me. I should have. <laughs> but that's why I didn't get here for morning glory. I'm doing afternoon, man, because I have to take care of my rib. God bless you. Have a smile upon you. <laughs> is my prayer. May the word of God penetrate your spirit, soul, and mind. Always remember that God loves you, we love you, there's nothing that no one can do about it. God bless you. Whew. Have a great day. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. And he is Lord.